What is this consul of Jerusalem? That's what we're going to find out in Acts 15. So Acts 15 is titled the Jerusalem Consul. We're going to find out what that is. So it says that man came down from Judea and we're teaching. Remember, Judea is up high. It doesn't really matter what direction they're coming from. It's not a north-south thing. It's an up and down thing. And started saying, you know, unless you're circumcised according to the customs of Moses, you can't be saved. Now, these are going to be people who are not representing the official church, but were believers in Jesus. But they had their own opinions. And again, it wasn't the official opinion, but they were saying that. And Paul and Barnabas, it says, had no small dissension and debate with them. So, in other, again, another kind of phrase like before, no small means very large. This was a big brouhaha. Some of the other people then were appointed to go to Jerusalem, up to Jerusalem, to the apostles and the elders and ask this question of them so they can make a decision. And they went on their way to Phoenicia. You know, that's going to be along the coast. Samaria, that's going to be on the inside bringing the details of conversion of Gentiles, and it brought them joy. This is about everybody. And so they get to Jerusalem, and they were welcomed by the church and the other apostles and the elders. See, we got more elders. And declared that God had done with them. And, and it says, told them everything. Told them everything God had done. Not taking credit for it. They're not boasting. They're saying God did this. And it says, some believers in the party of the Pharisees, so they were still Pharisee-ish, rose up and said, yeah, you have to. You have to get circumcised. You have to do these things. And the apostles and the elders gathered together, and it had been a lot of debate. They debated. Peter stood up and said, you know, God said in the early days that we should preach to the Gentiles the gospel word and the Holy Spirit, just as he did for us. There's no distinction between anyone, Jews, Gentiles, coming to everybody. We saw that happen already. And now you're putting God to the test. You're putting a yoke. A yoke is going to be the thing that you would put on oxen to help them pull the, uh, the plow behind them. You are putting this on them. And I think Jesus said too, that the Pharisees were putting a yoke on people that they couldn't complete and was harder than what God had told them to do. Now you're doing it again. You might be believers, but you still have that Pharisee thing where you're trying to make it harder for people than what God even requires of them. And here's the important things. And it says, quote, by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither their fathers nor we have been able to bear. Then the next part. We believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus just as they will. So it's all the same. We all have the same thing. We're going to be saved by grace, by his forgiveness, not anything to do with us, the rules, anything like that. I mean, think about it. It is why we don't follow the rules that Judaism does. And in fact, I used to know a Christian who did. They tried to follow all the Jewish rules as almost like Pharisees. The women had hair coverings, it was a very interesting situation, but they're making them do this. And again, it makes me think of the new wine and old wineskin. You're going to need a new wineskin. You, you are going to grow beyond the old thing. God, in some cases, you know, these were rules, in some cases set up in Deuteronomy and Leviticus and the kosher rules and the dressing rules and things like that. Some of them were meant to keep people together as a people, to make them sanctified, unique among the pagan worship people in the area. Like, don't do this because you don't want to appear like them. Those things are gone. We don't do this. And yet, you know, you think about it, there are times when we see that happening that, you know, people will say, well, you have to dress up to go to church. Now, maybe you want to, maybe you feel that it honors God in order to do it, but nowhere God calls you to do that. Don't put more rules on people. You know, don't recreate the thing we just got away from. The thing that Jesus said was not true. It says that everybody felt quiet. They listened to Barnabas and Paul about the signs and wonders and the things they did among the Gentiles. And then it says when they were done, James, we know that this is going to be 
the brother of Jesus, James, had died, the apostle James. He says, listen to me. Simeon had related how God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for his name. He he wants to make them his people too. And then he starts talking about the words of the prophet. Now, James would have been someone who knew. And he starts reading from Amos. And Amos, it says that, that God will return, rebuild the tent that David has fallen, rebuild its ruins, restore it. See, everyone's looking for that restoration of the physical world. They're looking for the city of David. But the remnants of man may seek the Lord. And all the Gentiles who call in my name, says the Lord, who make these things known from old. So it was always meant to be, again, when people think that this is just for us, this is just for the Jewish people, he says, no, this was always meant for the Gentiles. He says, so it is my judgment that we should not trouble the Gentiles who turn to God, but, you know, to get circumcised. This is a big deal. I mean, who would want to, I guess, get circumcised, particularly as adults, if they didn't want to be? But he says that you should abstain from things polluted by idols from sexual immorality, of course, and what has been strangled from blood. That was a common cultic behavior. And from the ancient generations of Moses had in every city, and it says, because all the generations of Moses in every city proclaim it, it should be read in every Sabbath and in the synagogue. James, well, he's in charge of the council, and he says very wise things. And so people are kind of confused because they say, In the first space, he says, don't make them do this thing. They're believers in God. They don't have to do anything else. And then the second part, he says, yeah, but then do these other things. Sexual morality, that's something that we already have. But, you know, some of these other things about the proper way to kill food so it wasn't cultic. And maybe you don't know this, but kosher is not just about what you can eat and what you can't eat. Can't eat usually eats animals with cloven hooves and I think, um, shellfish is in there and a bunch of things are in there, but it's also how you cook and prepare it. And so when anything is marked as kosher, it's not only the right thing, it was killed in the right way if it was killed, but it was also cooked in the right way. And the reason he's giving them these rules is not salvation-based. If they didn't eat something that was the wrong way, it's not going to condemn them. They're not going to be unclean before God. But he's suggesting to this to them because we're witnessing to the Jews. We're trying to be sensitive to something that would upset them greatly. So he's pointing this out that we should at least maintain these minimal things just so that we can have a good fellowship of the Jewish believers and not just the Jewish believers, but so a witness to them. But we don't want people to feel uncomfortable. And I think that's the interesting thing about their salvation. What saves you, right? We all know that. Believing that Jesus died for your sin and accepting his gift of redemption, right? We know that. That it's a bare minimum thing. Then there's like things that are good to do, not good to do. And rules that God gave us to do and not to do. This is more on the side of kindness to other people. That we don't want to trouble them in such a way that it'll turn them away or make them feel uncomfortable. That was kind of the general. So we don't have to go as far as circumcision, but if you could just eat in the proper way, it's best that you just do that. But we always had that conversation. We had this, I don't know, it was like one of those dorm room conversations where you're eating popcorn at three in the morning. Is it wrong for a Christian to watch a video or listen to music or go to a movie that's not really very good for them, that doesn't display Christian values and maybe in fact are against Christian values? And we were talking back and forth, you know, like, well, it might not have any effect to you. It might not do anything for you. You're just enjoying the entertainment in general. And then we started talking about, yeah, but you're also giving money to encourage this kind of thing. And it's being shown to people, too, who might have problems with this entertainment. Seeing something this violent or seeing something this rated R might affect their behavior. And so aren't we giving money to people? that would create more of this and maybe injure more other people, even if we're not personally injured to it. But then the other part came in is, what if there are other people in your church who kind of look at that and go, oh, well, Joe, watch that. Boy, that's really disappointing. You know, and 
now you've kind of broken the heart of somebody in their opinion of you because you did something. So I think it's more than just what should you do and what shouldn't you do. I think there's also a kindness in there too. And I think that's exactly what James is saying. So the apostles, the elders thought that was good for the whole church and chose to be um, around them and send them to Antioch. They chose men from among them and sent them with Paul and Barnabas to go to Antioch again. There's a Judas called Barsabbas. There's a Silas. And they were leaders among the men, it said. Because we're going to go and help that new fledgling church just so they can grow in their faith. You know, they're brand new. We've been doing this for a while now. We've been together for a while. We have apostles walking around. Let's send them some help. Uh, so they sent a letter saying that uh, the apostles and the elders, and then to the Gentiles who are in Antioch, Syria, greetings. We have heard that some people have gone out from us and troubled you, you know, told you these things and gave you instructions. That was not from us. It seems good for us, having come to one accord, we are all in agreement to choose men and send them to you along with beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of Jesus. So therefore we sent Judas and Silas, who them, them who themselves will tell you the same thing we're telling you in this letter. They're going to t- talk to you in words. You know, I probably want to discuss some things. The letter is one thing, but, you know, words and discussion and, and talking about it's another. So it seems it says good for the Holy Spirit to lay hands on you so that no greater burden is, is coming of these requirements. Told them that they should abstain from what is being sacrificed to idols, from blood, and from sexual immorality. And if you do these things, it'll do well for you. Again, it's not saving. It's not condemning. It, you'll, you'll do well. This will be good. So they uh, sent the letter off. They sent Silas, Barnabas, Paul, and Judas away to go meet with the new church. And it said they were encouraged and strengthened. And this was interesting. It says, then Judas and Silas, who were themselves prophets, remember prophets are going to be the people who say the word of God, whether it's in the future or it's right now. They were sent off in peace by the brothers who had sent them. And so they, they came back. You know, we had enough discussion. We're good with it now. Paul and Barnabas remained for a little bit, teaching and preaching the word of God. So other people might believe. And it says, after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let's go back and visit our brothers in every city we proclaim the word of God and see how they're doing. You know, that's a good thing. Like I said, we're growing a church. We don't have our boots on their necks. We're not just saying these things and then walking away. We want to grow disciples. And let's go visit them. And so Barnabas says, you know, I want to take John Mark. I don't think I emphasize this at all, but what happened is, is John Mark left them when they were there before. And Paul thought, no, we shouldn't bring John Mark. You know, he abandoned us before. Let's take someone, you know, let's take someone else, someone who hasn't abandoned us like Mark did, John Mark did. I get the idea that maybe John Mark was very young or he was scared. It says that this happened in um, Pamphylia. It said a, a, there was a big disagreement between them and they separated from each other. And so they, they left each other and Barnabas took Mark and went to Cyprus. And Paul chose Silas and departed. And they went and met with the brothers that they talked to about the grace of the Lord and went through Syria and Cilicia and strengthened the church. And it's easy for us to see this as a disagreement like, uh uh-oh, here's a rift. Here's something that happened that's bad. When when I listen to a lot of the different commentaries and pastors speak about this particular chapter, you could look at it that way, that maybe this was bad. But instead, both missions, Barnabas and John, Mark, Paul and Silas, were blessed. They were able to split up the work. So they had a disagreement and maybe they just didn't want to see each other for a little bit. Whatever. It's fine. And the both missions were blessed. They were able to do twice the amount of work. And they each had their point of view. Barnabas, the son of encouragement. Made me think too about Barnabas, the son of encouragement. Does that mean his father was a good encourager too? Because Barnabas sure learned that lesson. He's about growing people. He wants to take what happened with John Mark and help him grow from it. 
Meanwhile, Paul is like, we got a big, tough mission here. We need people we can depend on. Is either of them wrong? Probably both right. They just had different opinions. Being a believer in Jesus doesn't take away our personal views and our personal opinions. We still have those. So why worry? Why think that this was a mistake? It was probably good because everyone continued their ministry. The church was strengthened by it. We'll find out in later chapters, too, that Paul and John Mark, they make their amends. No problems. This isn't a war. This isn't a battle. This is something that's going to come back together to us later. And that ends chapter 15. What I'm going to meditate on this week is how hard it is. I think it's really easy for us to get into doctrinal wars about with anything from other people. And we battle it out and we send our elders to think about it, our people who are studied in Greek and in Hebrew and know the Old Testament, and try to come to an answer. And you know what? We, we do come to answers, and sometimes we come to different answers because that's why we're all in different denominations, I guess. But it's good that we have people who want to come up to wise decisions, that we think of it as bad because look at that church. Look what they decided. There's no other way really to it. We have to have people in leadership positions who can make wise decisions. What I'm going to pray about is that we learn to do a better job of disagreeing without hating each other. That we each go on our way, on our mission, we do the thing that we were going to do it in the way we were going to do it, as long as it's godly and it's, you know, in the right spirit of believers and Jesus and the Bible. But it doesn't have to be an either or thing in every case. It can be an and, just like Paul and Barnabas showed us. And what I'm going to share with others is that a lot of our doctrine does come from the very early church, but that the apostles, in this case, the council in Jerusalem, James, the brother of Jesus, thought about how to do things. People were confused, and they did the best that they could, asking the Holy Spirit to help them. But in the end, you know, these are going to be sometimes decisions made of men, you know, that we have to decide, are people going to get circumcised or not? Are they going to eat meat sacrificed to idols or not? Are we going to go see that really bad movie this week or not? Are we hurting ourselves? Are we hurting our brothers and sisters around us when they see us going to that? Are we encouraging more of it? We have so many things that we have to consider. And what I'm going to share is it's always a good idea to go to those people, whether it's a council or not, elders, to get another opinion. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember, I have other podcasts and you can find them on a abetterlifeinsmallsteps.com. That is the main hub. There's all the podcasts I have. And in the main text, it's a blog article that my friend M writes. Thanks so much for listening. Thanks.